Why hello lovely humans, Jen Foxbot here. Welcome to another edition of Math Mondays. Da 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 da, yeah! All right, jazz hands, heck yeah. Okay, so in this episode, we return to Fourier series, yay! Fourier series. And we have a special version of Fourier series in this episode, the complex form of Fourier series. Yes, I love complex numbers, they're so useful. So, um, in this episode, we will look at how to write the general form of a Fourier series in complex notation, which involves imaginary numbers. And again, they're not imaginary in the sense that they don't exist. They are physical numbers. They do exist in the real world. It's just that humans like to make definitions and then later realize that our definitions are too limiting and we're like, ah, oh, shoot, we need another number. So that's what happened with imaginary numbers. Um, and then uh, in part two, we will look at how to uh, apply the complex form of Fourier series to the same example that we did with the sine and cosine version of a Fourier series, and hopefully we get the same result. Will we? I don't know. Find out. Dun dun dun! <laughs> okay, so let's get a crack um, in. This, uh, in this one, uh, I want to start by looking at a few equations that you will need to be comfortable with, or at least know, um, in order to uh, really understand how the complex Fourier series works. So the first equation, which is a really popular and profound equation, is Euler's equation. Yeah! Um, and so what that looks like is that e to the i and x can be written as a sine, uh, sum of sine and cosine. Uh, and so Euler did this as a Taylor expansion. Uh, one of my videos, I want to say the complex plane video does this? Eh, I'll link to it. Um, okay, so e to the i and x can be written as cosine of an x plus i sine an x. Okay, so that's equation number one. And then just how uh, e to the i x or i n x, where n is an integer or a whole number, um, just how e can be written in terms of sine and cosine, both sine and cosine can also be written in terms of e, like so. So we have sine of n x, which equals e to the i n x minus e to the negative i n x divided by 2i, and cosine of nx is almost exactly the same with a slight change in sine. Uh, S-I-G-N, not S-I-N-E, uh, plus e to the i, or negative i and x, divided by 2i. Cool. Okay. So um, I am going to erase these in a second. Uh, so maybe take a screenshot. <laughs> okay. Um, but I, I just want to put these out there um, as kind of the assumptions that I'm going to make throughout the rest of this video, that you are comfortable with these equations um, and that uh, you know where they come from or whatever. Um, if not, totally fine. Uh, it took me a while to really understand these. It took me a lot of graphing and playing around with these equations um, until they were shoved into my head. Uh, so if you're curious about these, or if you're a little uncomfortable with any of these equations, please just let me know, uh, and we can uh, derive them, talk about them, use them in an example, etc, etc. Just let me know what you're interested in, and if you don't know exactly the right question to ask, just be like, what is that third equation with cosine? How I don't get it, and I'll break it down. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to erase these so that we can make room for the general form of the complex Fourier series. Okay, okay, <clears throat> very serious. So uh, basically what happens uh, when we want to expand a function in a Fourier series is that we are going to get, um, oh my, I don't know what my upstairs neighbor is doing right now, good times. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do is when we expand a function in a Fourier series, um, we need a periodic function, or a function that repeats over time. Uh, but basically, the general formula wants, uh, we need to contain all possible uh, versions of any function. So basically that just means every integer. And so what that looks like is we have our first coefficient, c0 or c0, and then we add in all of the positive uh, coefficients for e to the i uh, nx, or just ix, because in this first one, um, n equals 1. 
Uh, and so then we do this, C2 e to the 2ix plus C3 e to the 3ix plus dot dot dot. And so uh, our integers continue on until positive infinity, so a very long time. Uh, but also we want to include the negative integers as well. So in this case, we have c to the negative one, e to the negative ix, plus c to the negative two, e to the negative two ix, plus c negative three, e to the, whoops, that's a funny e, e to the negative three ix, plus dot, dot, dot. So and then in this case, um, our coefficients or our uh, integers extend to negative infinity. And this is really time consuming to write, so let's write this shorter. Ha ha, I thought about this ahead of time, so now we can write it up here, and we'll use a summation sign. So we sum uh, an infinite number of terms starting from negative infinity going until positive infinity, um, and we have a coefficient uh, with a little subscript n so that we know what coefficient it is and what term it's multiplied by. Uh, times e to the i n x. And so as you go from negative infinity, you'll have negative integers up here. That's how you get the negative um, exponents. And as you get uh, crossover to zero um, and you go from to positive infinity, these become positive. So in this sense, um, this is our general form for the complex version of a Fourier series. So any periodic or repeating function that you are given can be broken down into a series of uh, terms with e to the i n x. Uh, but now the question is, how do we find these coefficients? Hmm. That's pretty important, because for the most part, um, these terms, they change a little bit, but the, the coefficients are what is going to determine how much this term contributes. In other words, if we wanted to be lazy, aka, or we don't have infinite amount of storage space, we need to know at what point can we cut off these terms. Can we stop at three? That would be great. I don't know. It depends on what C, uh, three, four, five, etc. are. A good, a good way to think about this is like, if let's say C17 was one half, and then C18 was like, I don't know, one over 10 million, it's a very, uh, very, very small number, and then C19 was less than C18, um, etc. We could say, okay, well, C17 is much, much, much larger than C18, 19, and all of the rest of the coefficients, so therefore we can stop our Fourier series after n equals 17. Um, and you would do the same for the negative, uh, negative numbers. And so basically this allows us to uh, save some time and space by uh, basically figuring out uh, which terms we can ignore because they don't really uh, contribute to our series that much. Okay, and that is really, really, really crucial when we are taking a uh, sound wave and converting it into a digital signal because we definitely don't have infinite storage space and when I turn on the radio, I don't want to wait 35 million hours for my song to come on. I want it now. So at a certain point, you have to end the Fourier series so that all of the information can get sent and that I can hear my radio. Okay, so all of that is to say the coefficients are very important, so we need a way to find them. Um, and this is actually where we get to bring back the average value function that we used in the sine and cosine uh, Fourier series to find the coefficients of both the sine and the cosine terms. Um, so in this case, we have um, a function of the form e to the i and x, and um, it's a little bit hard to plot. I would definitely recommend looking it up, but basically what we find is that um, on the interval of negative pi to pi, the average value, a v for short, of this uh, function is zero, boop, with a line through it, yeah. Okay, and so basically what this allows us to do is say, okay, well, we want to find the average value of um, our general Fourier series so that we can pull out the coefficients and uh, figure out what they are equal to. So what that means 
is that we are going to take uh, the average value function, let me make sure that I get it right, uh, which looks like this, one over two pi from negative pi to pi, um, f of x dx. Okay, and so now we plug in our general form, um, which is going to give us Wait, hold on, let me just double check again. Okay, yeah, so um, C naught or C zero is a lot different than the rest of these because E to the zero goes to one. And so there actually is no uh, E term multiplied by our constant. So the first term I'm gonna write separate as one over two pi times C naught from negative pi to pi of one times dx. And the rest of the terms uh, for Cn, both from negative infinity to infinity, um, are going to be of the form one over two pi, negative pi to pi of um, Cn, f, uh, whoops, Cn, I'll write this more specifically, Cn e to the i n x d x. Okay, but wait a second, didn't we just say that the average value of this function from negative pi to pi was zero? Well, yeah, okay, so that makes our lives easier. Boom, that goes to zero. So then we get that the average value of our function um, that we are expanding in our Fourier series from negative pi to pi is just equal uh, to C naught over two pi, um, X from pi to, or sorry, negative pi to pi, uh, and then this actually equals C naught over two pi, negative pi, or sorry, pi minus negative pi, there we go, pi minus a negative pi, uh, the, the negative signs cancel, this becomes two pi, this cancels with this, and we just get C naught. Okay, wait, what? What just happened? Well, basically what we just showed is that the average value of our function that we are expanding in a Fourier series over the interval from negative pi to pi is equal to C naught. That's pretty interesting. But it doesn't really help us with um, the rest of the constant terms. We now have an equation for the first one, uh, which would just be C naught equals this piece. And that's pretty straightforward because we would be given this function that we are trying to expand. Um, but we need to know the rest of these infinite numbers of coefficients. So how do we do that? Well, if the sine and cosine is fresh in your mind, you'll remember that we multiplied the average value function, this function, or this equation, I should say, um, we multiplied this equation by uh, sine nx when we were trying to find the sine coefficients, and by cosine nx when we were trying to find the cosine coefficients. So this is very similar, but in this case, we're gonna multiply by the complex conjugate, which is e to the negative i n x. So I'm gonna erase this, which you'll see why in a second, and I'll give myself more space on the blackboard. Okay, so now um, we multiply the average value function by this complex conjugate. And so we get one over two pi, negative pi to pi, f of x times e to the negative i n x dx. And now we can start to uh, break it down and solve uh, for the general form of the coefficient. Um, so one over two pi, um, negative pi to pi cn times e to the i n x times e to the negative i n x dx equals, we can pull our coefficient out, so cn over 2 pi, uh, negative pi to pi. Since the e's are multiplied together, that means we can uh, add the exponents, so that's going to give us e to the i n x minus i n x dx. Wait a second, this just equals zero. Ho oh, ho, that's handy. So then uh, we have e to the zero, which goes to one. And so now, oops, now we have cn over 2 pi. We only have a 1 in our integral, so we get, again, x from negative pi to pi. And since we already showed uh, that uh, pi minus negative pi is going to give us 2 pi, the 2 pi over 2 pi goes to 1, so we just have that. <gasps> Look at that! That's 
that's super handy. So now we have an equation to find the constants of our complex Fourier series. Yay! Okay, fun times. Um, so basically, the benefit of this is that rather than two equations to find the constants for sine and cosine, one equation for sine, one equation for cosine, you gotta memorize that unless you wanna do the derivation all over again. Uh, but with the complex form, we actually only have one equation. So even though um, we got an equation for C naught out of the first uh, attempt, um, this equation holds true for all values of n from negative infinity to positive infinity, including C naught. Because what you'll find, if you do it, and you totally should, is that when you plug in zero for n, this term just goes to one, and then you have f of x times one times dx, and you're kind of back uh, where we just were. Um, and again, for f of x, uh, you would be given this function, or at least you're given a way to break it down. Um, so this is something that uh, you have to calculate c of n. Okay, I'm going to end it there. And so in part two, uh, we are going to use this equation for the constants and apply it to the same example that we did uh, with sine and cosine, and then we can compare and contrast. Um, please let me know if you have any questions about this derivation, about uh, complex numbers, or again, any of the uh, complex equations with E, sine, and cosine that we mentioned. Um, e is this like mystical number that pops up everywhere. Um, it's a very interesting number. If you want to learn more about E, um, please also let me know. Cool. All right. So see you in part two. Yay!